Let's now prepare our hearts as we come before the Lord. In Psalm chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, it's written, I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Beloved, you and I must admit that there are times when we don't praise the Lord with all of our hearts, isn't it? At times, probably, we stood in church with a hymn book in our hand, singing a great worship song, but not singing with our, with our hearts. I believe the key is to focus on the Lord, who He is, and what He has done. So let us ask God to help us worship Him, to focus on Him alone, because worship is not about us. It's all about God. Can I hear an amen to that? Amen. amen. So let's join our hearts in prayer as we commit our worship celebration to the Lord. Our most high God and Father, we confess that at times we do not worship you with all of our hearts. At times we allow our worries and concerns to distract us from worshiping you with all of our minds. Sometimes our physical circumstances prevent us from worshiping you with all of our strength. Forgive us, Father, when we do not worship you with all of our beings. As we come before your holy presence, would you help us to worship you with all of our hearts? Enable us, Father, to focus on you alone and help us put aside our worries, our concerns, so that we can focus on who you are and what you have done. As we come to worship you, Father, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you our rock and our redeemer. May we mean every word we utter. May we focus on you alone. May you alone be glorified and may your name alone be lifted up. And all who are ready to worship God with all of their hearts say, Amen. Church, please rise. And together, let us praise and worship the God of Abraham, the same God that we worship today.
to 15 says, Then Moses said to God, I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Let us continue to worship the great I am. Who is 
May you be praised this day, Father. And all God's children say, Amen and Amen. Can we all be seated? Good morning. We are live here at Auditorium A, and we have two brothers and two sisters who are following the Lord in obedience to water baptism. There are two ordinances as Christians we are expected to observe. That is, one is uh, the Lord's communion, which we celebrate once a month, and the other is to follow the Lord in water baptism. So we praise God as we call uh, Sister May Brosas. May, have you repented of your sins and received Jesus as your Savior and Lord? Yes. Are you willing to commit the rest of your life for His glory? Yes. May, because of your profession of faith and as a way to welcome you to Jesus' family, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Daniel Pukan. Dan, have you repented of your sins and received Jesus in your heart as your Savior and Lord? Yes. Are you willing to commit the rest of your life for His glory? Yes. Dan, because of your profession of faith and as a way to welcome you to Jesus' family, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. John Matthew Poblete. Matthew, have you repented of your sins and received Jesus as your Savior and Lord? Yes. Are you willing to commit the rest of your life for His glory? Yes. Matthew, because of your profession of faith and as a way to welcome you to Jesus' family, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sister Cora Navarro, our youngest... Baptism candidate. Yes, she is the youngest in the faith. See, Nanai Cora. Nanai Cora, have you repented of your sins and received Jesus in your heart? as your Savior and Lord? Yes. Are you willing to commit the rest of your life for His glory? Yes. And I call up because of your profession of faith and as a way to welcome you to Jesus' family, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Kneel down. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for our brothers and sisters. Lord, I pray for Sister Cora, Sister May, Daniel, Lord, and Matthew, Lord, that you continue to bless them, Lord, as they commit their lives unto you. May they use their spiritual gifts in the building of the body as they are built up as well, as they become active in the church and in your service. Because we pray these things as we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. It's now time for us to worship God through our giving. In Psalm chapter 55, verses 22 and 23, it is written, Cast your cares on the Lord, and He will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. But you, O God, will bring down the wicked into the pit of corruption. Bloodthirsty and deceitful men will not live out half their days. But as for me, I will trust in you. Beloved, this promise tells us that we Christians are not exempted from any burdens. David is not talking about another's, another person's burden, although that's a good burden to carry for each of us to carry our bur other, each one another's burdens. The burdens in your life today are what God has ordained for you. 
Burdens help us grow. They help us exercise the muscles of our faith. They teach us how to trust God. And they teach us to build our character. And when we cast our cares on the Lord, He promises to sustain us one day at a time. So as the ushers come to receive our offerings, let us commit these resources to the Lord in prayer. Indeed, Father, we can cast all our cares and burdens on you because we know that you will sustain us. You are truly faithful, Father. We ask that you bless our humble offerings and use them for the building up of your kingdom and the proclamation of your great name to all the nations. May our giving reflect our complete trust in you. May you find us faithful in our giving today, Father. And all who trust in God's faithfulness say, Amen.
it's now time for us to read scripture together. And our passage for today is Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. Just one verse. But in order for us to understand the context of the verse, we will be reading verses 1 to 17 of Exodus chapter 20. So kindly open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 17. And in reverence to the reading of God's holy word, please rise as we read the Ten Commandments aloud together. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his manservant, or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Praise God for the reading of his commandments. You may be seated. Good morning, beloved. And we welcome you back to our series on the Ten Commandments. And uh, this morning, our emphasis really is on following what is called the Third Commandment. And I would like you to realize that as we look at the so-called third commandment, it is really because sometimes we, we struggle understanding it because today, Filipinos' names are not usually connected to anything about their reputation or character. I mean, they're hard to link together. So I did a little bit, bit of research once it appears here, and I found out that the genius of the Filipino is a very good way of now showing what I want to prove to you this morning. How have Pinoy's connected their business names and their business functions? So let me begin with an example of something I found on the net. So this is a barber shop, Caesar's Palace. See, that's the genius of the Pinoy. Uh, Filipino names for people hard to connect, but function for businesses and their names. How about this, uh, this one? Look at this. It's a bakery named Bread Pit. <laughs> How can you forget that, huh? Especially now that Angelina and Brad have separated. No more Brangelina. Uh, how about a fishbowl stand that's named Facebook? Uh, look at how they got the logo. I, I hope they don't get sued. Uh, but there is a big like. I will like this if I could, you know. And then here's my favorite. A funeral parlor named Living Things. <laughs> uh, I wonder why I'll do, I'll do funeral service there. <laughs> I'm telling my wife, if I die, please do not put me there, even free. <laughs> Can you imagine, Pastor Larry, he is buried at living things. <laughs> That's the genius of the Filipino. 
they're able to connect their business name somehow with their business function. Beloved, that's the closest I can come to when trying to make you understand. That is what's behind the third commandment. God is trying to tell us that my name as God, by whatever title I've allowed you to call me, it's inseparable from who I am. My reputation, my character, my authority, you cannot separate it from my name, so God says. So don't take my name lightly in your lips. Because the first commandment is actually telling us, beloved, about worshiping God, the only and exclusive God. There are other gods, yes, but they're all fake. They're not real. So the first commandment is just telling us no other gods, just God. And then you remember Elder Dylan doing such a great job telling you and I, hey, God not only says He's the only God, you worship Him alone, He's also saying don't try to have visual representations either of the one true God, trying to reduce Him to a graven image, or substitute gods. And that application was extended even to idolatry called greed by Elder Dylan. Now, the second commandment is about visual, but the third one, the one we studied this morning, is on verbal representations of God, with His name as an extension of His person. Now, let me open us in a word of prayer. But as I do, I'd like you to also join me as we pray for the country and as we pray for our church. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come as a church family, to be blessed together because we're asking you to show your glory, Lord, once again, just like Moses pleaded with you to show us your glory through the wonder of your word, through the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. Show us your glory today, O oh Father. Help us come away from this place worshiping you, transformed inside our hearts, not because our minds were filled with academic information, but because our hearts were warmed by the work of the Spirit using the words of God. And Father, even as we ask you to speak to our hearts, we plead with you, humbly, Father, for your continuing mercy upon our nation, upon our country, even while we celebrate with joy the wonderful things happening in the country, the reduced crime rate, the success of Operation Tokhang, which has encouraged many to seek rehab or surrender voluntarily without violence and so on. We thank you for this, Father. But even as we do, we keep praying as a church family without ascribing or judging anybody. Put an end, we pray, to this street executions or what people call extrajudicial killings by whoever is doing it. And we dare not judge because we are not investigators or political analysts. We're simply churchgoers, a church family who plead with you. Please put an end to these things, Father, by whoever or whatever cause they're coming from. Father, we pray for our Senate. Lord, whether the extrajudicial killings investigation ends or not, we're praying that the message has been driven clear, that these things must stop. And Lord, we pray that if they do end this investigation, the consciousness of the public will always be there, and the clamor to end it will always be there. Lord, we pray for the Congress as they continue their investigation into the selling of drugs by supposed inmates in our most secure institutions, penal institutions, Father. And Lord, again without judging ahead, because we are not the experts. We pray that you help them come to the right conclusions, that there will be no such thing as trial by press or publicity, but that, Lord, if there's anyone guilty, let them be exposed and prosecuted. And, Father, we pray that if anybody is not worthy of, of serving your people, let them be, Lord, removed from position and even tried to the fullest extent of the law. But, Father... 
we also pray you put an end to our inmates being sold drugs or controlling the drug trade from within the supposed most secure prisons in the land. And Father, we continue to pray for our president, President, president Rodrigo Duterte. Father, we have prayed and will always pray for your blessing upon him. We have prayed and will always pray for your protection for him. We thank you in many ways for him because of his political will. We thank you for his exertion of the efforts against drugs and criminality and corruption. We thank you that it is statistically proven that criminality, the rate has gone down. We thank you for that, Lord, because of how it transcends to good for us. But we continue to pray, Lord, that you also guide our president in his public statements. Remind him always he cannot make statements that do not affect the country at all. Please give him, Lord, the right advisors and counselors for this task and help him when needed restrain his emotions or his words because they do affect the country, Lord. But Father, despite that, we thank you that economically the country has not really been damage as severely as people thought, and uh, the rising dollar has affected all worldwide currencies, and yet, Lord, it has not affected our country as badly as other countries. Our stock, our, our stock indexes, indices have, are not as badly damaged as other countries, Lord. Thank you for sustaining our country economically in this way. And Father, we thank you again for the leadership that you placed over us in observance of Romans 13, 1 to 6 and 1 Timothy chapter 2. We pray for their success and blessing, Father. We pray for our church as we enter our, third, our fourth quarter of the year, the time when we plan and budget for the next year, the time when we, Lord, by your grace, seek new lay leaders to to lead and come alongside the pastors. We pray for the incoming elders, Lord. You warned us not to lay hands on anyone hastily. We observe that, Father, and we ask for your mercy that by your grace, only men of God who fear God, in whom is the Holy Spirit, will come and be part of our eldership. We pray for servant leaders to come in as deacons, Lord, people whose hearts are for service, not authority, people whose hearts are bowed down to you, who will observe the Word of God and let that be the standard by which they want the church to be run, not tradition, not culture, not outside politics. Remove from this church, Lord, the concept of the necessity of a check and balance like the world perceives it. Bring within our church a culture of trust, relying on your sovereign control, not on the methods of men, believing that because you are God, you will expose sin, and we dare not, Lord, judge others before the time. Father, we now pray for ourselves. As we meditate on your word today, speak to our hearts through the power of your Spirit, and use the words, Lord, that you gave to Moses more than 3,000 years ago to be real and clear to us in 2016. Teach us how to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. Help us do that today through the third commandment. For it is in Jesus and through Jesus that we ask this. Amen. And amen. Before I go further, I would like you to do you have one of these? Will you please bring this home and then bring it every Sunday? You see, this will save us time. Otherwise, I will have to go through this like I did with the book of Revelation, always going back to a foundation. This is the foundation of everything in the Ten Commandments. Five principles common to all ten. I will not read them anymore for you in the interest of time, but they are so basic it keeps us from being legalistic about the Ten Commandments. If we do not understand these five principles, we will be driven to performance mentality. So I, I'd like you to read this 
imbibe what it says and realize the value of the Ten Commandments for both Christians and even those who are still seeking for the truth. So, let's proceed, beloved. Why do we study the Third Commandment? Three reasons I want to share with you this morning. One, it teaches us how to love God. Remember, the first four commandments are all about God. Uh, it answers to the question, how do I show love for God? Which is the first commandment. You shall love the Lord your God. Commandment one, two, three, four. Commandment one, no other gods. Commandment two, no, no substitute gods. Commandment three, revere, honor, fear the name of the Lord. So that's one reason why it's important. It teaches us how to love God. Number two, it teaches us how to fear God. Pastor, is that important? Aren't you supposed to just love God, beloved? The Bible never separates the fear of God and the love of God. The fear of God is simply a reverential awe of God, looking at His power, looking at His glory, and realizing that God has the power to be present everywhere. How dare I sin against Him and think I will not be caught? God has the power to know everything going on in my life. I cannot hide from God. God has the power to expose it. Do you remember I gave you a story about three or four years ago when I, together with the elders, did one of the most unpleasant things that I do not like to do in this church, but it has to be done. We call it church discipline. Do you remember that? I shared a story with you that one of the elders, revealing a godly character, asked, how do we make sure we, pastors and elders, do not fall into the same sin? And all I could say was this, besides the love of God, it's the fear of God. You and I must realize nothing can be hidden from God. If you are a Christian, God will make sure it gets exposed. He will. And that's called a reverential awe of God. And the third commandment teaches us that aside from the love of God. And thirdly, last but not least, we study the third commandment because if you learn, if I learn to honor God, it good for, it's good for us. There's a blessing. But if I do not honor God, there's judgment. Yes, I mean Christians, not just unsaved people. So, beloved, that's actually the bottom line. Those who honor God's name actually honor God Himself and will be blessed. But those who dishonor His name will be judged. Do you remember those pictures I showed you? They're a good reminder. In the Bible, that's how it goes. Name, character, reputation, inseparable. So, beloved, this commandment addresses any insincere reference to God because His name is the revelation of His person. And before I talk about the command itself, uh, can I share with you from my heart, this is one of those passages uh, I prepared for to preach where I had to say, ouch, many times. You see, we who preach, we often take God's name in our lips. And as I was preparing this, I had to say, Lord, i uh, not done good here. Sorry. Sorry. Ouch. Sorry. Ouch. So maybe it will be the same experience for you today, hopefully. So let's look at the command. Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Pastor, why is God so concerned about His name? Is He... Is he ultra-sensitive? Is he a cranky old man sitting on his throne? And you know, old people, they get cranky. Is that what he is? No. It's because his name, first of all, is connected with his reputation. It's connected with his reputation. You've heard people say, oh, that guy, he's rising fast in the business world. He's making a name for himself. Or you see a rising young songstress and you say, oh, that girl, she's very good. She's making a good name for herself, or you see a, a, a minor criminal, you know, somebody who's doing petty things, and you, he, you hear him getting more and more involved with the big-time syndicate, and you say, that guy is rising fast in the criminal underworld. He's making a bad name for himself. Beloved, in the Bible, it's like that. You cannot separate your name and your reputation. For example, what comes into your mind when I say a certain name, like, Hitler, 
What do you think of? Holocaust. Six million Jews ruthlessly killed. Uh, World War II, where millions from other countries were killed. Hitler. What about when I say Billy Graham? What comes into your mind? A 90-plus-year-old servant of God who's lived his entire life free of any public scandal. You know, I think of him when I want to end well. I want to end like him, not necessarily live to 90 plus, you know. I keep telling my wife I'm willing to die after our 50th wedding anniversary. That's all I want to live for. But Billy Graham, man of God, servant of God, clean name, still serving God up to now with his statements. What about when I say your name? What comes into people's minds? Are you one of those names, you know, where people jokingly say, if you approach this person, say my name. Sabay ilag. (laughs) Drop my name and then dodge because he'll try to hit you. Uh, I hope that's not what happens to you, beloved. Reputation and name for God are inseparable. Number two, His name represents character, His being. In the Bible, what you are cannot be separated from your name. That's why many times in the Bible, God would change the name of a character when He wanted to change that character's destiny because they were inseparable. Abram, exalted father, God changed His name to Abraham, father of many, Sarah, Sarai, princess, became Sarah, mother of a multitude or mother of many. What about uh, Jacob? What does Jacob mean? Somebody who supplants. In Tagalog, it's stronger. Manunulot, Jacob. When his name was changed to Israel, what does it mean? Somebody who struggled with God and has power with God. What about Simon? God has heard, becomes Peter, a rock. Not the rock. Jesus is the rock, but Peter means a rock. God would help build the church through him based on Jesus, the rock. So that, beloved, is an example of how names represent character. And one thing more, God's name represents his authority. They cannot be separated. For example, you were in a business meeting. You're an executive or you're a businessman. You told your secretary, I don't want anybody to disrupt my meeting, okay? It's very important. And then your secretary knocks at the door. "Uh, uh, Ma'am, sir, there is a call by a certain Mr. Rodrigo de la Cruz. And so you rock your brain. Rodrigo de la Cruz. Was that my classmate from grade one? No, his name was Rodrigo de los Santos. So he said... Will you please ask Mr. De La Cruz, if it's not an emergency, can I just call him back? And so your secretary says, yes, I'm sorry for disturbing your meeting. One minute later, she returns. Sir, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Uh, What is it? Uh, The phone was choppy. It's not Rodrigo De La Cruz calling. Uh, Who is it? It's Rodrigo Duterte. (laughs) Uh, And you're shocked, you know, you suddenly waken up out of your sleep and you say, Oh, I, I have to take the call. Why? Because the name represents authority. It's the same with God. His name, dear friends, is authority. And God is saying, because of my reputation, character, and authority, inseparable from my, my name, whatever name I've allowed you to call me, whether it's God, whether it's Father, whether it's God the Son, or Lord Jesus Christ, or Spirit of the Living God, or Holy Spirit, or Trinity, any of these that I've allowed you to use for me, they're connected with my reputation, character, authority. Don't you dare take it lightly on your lips. Are you following me, beloved? That's what's in a name. So, Pastor, how do I misuse God's name? Beloved, the first way that we misuse God's name is irreverent. What does it mean? Well, speaking or thinking of God in a way that insults Him by not taking Him seriously. For example, using God's name to insult people. Uh, I want to quote a writer who said, God's first name, of course, is God, but His middle name is not Dam, and His last name is not You. 
So don't join these three words together. There was a mother who fetched his boy playing in the playground together with his dad. And he heard the boy cursing one of his uh, playmates with those three words together. Please allow me not to say, okay? I don't want to take God's name in vain here in the pulpit. So the mother pulled him out and scolded him, young man. How did you learn to talk that way? And the boy hesitated, looked at his dad and said, Dad, can I tell her? He learned it from his dad. Using God's name to insult. What's the other way? Using God's name to indulge. This is when we excuse ourselves and blame God. Have you ever had that experience? Somebody will tell you, you know, I didn't feel led by the Spirit to get out of bed and go to work. Oh, really, the Holy Spirit is now responsible. Or sometimes it's like, uh, you know, God doesn't want me to honor our agreement. Now God is the alibi for you to get out of an agreement. Oh, really, I prayed about it. We use God as a cover for ourselves and indulge ourselves. What's another way? Using God's name to intimidate. Have you heard this TV evangelist say, if you do not send X amount of dollars within the next two weeks, my ministry will close. So now it's my fault that your ministry will close. You know, you have, you have to respond in your mind and say, well, go ahead and close. Stop trying to use God's name to intimidate me to giving you more of my money. I remember many years ago when I was still an elder, I think I was chairman of the elders at that time. Dr. Luis Pantoa and I were in a meeting with another church over a certain controversy, and it was going well. You know why? Because the senior pastor of that church was a reasonable man and easy to talk with. So the meeting was going well. It was about to end with both sides coming to an agreement until suddenly one of the lay leaders out of the blue said, But we insist on pushing through with this because God dropped this into our lap. And you know, Pastor Luis has a very witty way of answering. He simply said, God dropped this into your lap. So the meeting is done. There's nothing to talk about. He was saying, if you're going to quote the name of God, why did we even meet? Who are we to stand against God? And again, to the credit of the other senior pastor who was a reasonable man. He diffused that tense moment. It ended well for GCF, but God blessed them even more. God blessed them because of their senior pastor handling it well. So that, beloved, is one personal memory I have about using God's name to intimidate. In Matthew 5.37, Jesus instructed His disciples to avoid Frivolous swearing. He said, your yes should be yes, your no should be no. In other words, do not use an oath carelessly in everyday speech to deceive people, to victimize them by swearing that you're telling the truth, especially if you're not. So that is another way, using God's name to intimidate. How about this way, using God's name to impress? You know, when you use God's name like a cliché. Sadly, there are some, some sincere people who do not mean any harm, but praise the Lord. And hallelujah peppers every other sentence they say, you know. Uh, two years ago when I was uh, in John MacArthur's Shepherds Conference, I met this pastor from another church and denomination. He was a fan of Mani Pacquiao. So he was telling me, did you see that last fight of Mani Pacquiao against Algeri? Huh? Did you see Manny give the left cross? Hallelujah. But then he got a counterpunch. He staggered. Hallelujah. I said, wait a minute. Are you on Pacquiao's side or against him? Because you keep saying hallelujah anyway. Uh, he said, well, it, it's just a habit. I thought in my mind I couldn't tell him. Exactly. That's the problem. Hallelujah has become an expression for you. It means praise the Lord. So please don't use hallelujah to describe a left cross and a counter punch. Here's a tip. I told you I said said, ouch a lot because we preachers, you know, sometimes you would come by the door and say, Pastor, thank you. Today, my office mate who came to GCF the first time, 
She prayed to receive the Lord. And sometimes we preachers, we just carelessly say, praise the Lord. But you know, here's a tip, which I tell myself. I tell myself, say it slowly. Praise the Lord. Or glory to God. Not glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Expressions, cliches. But if I say it in my heart, really? She accepted the Lord? Glory to God. Will you go to the information booth so she could be discipled? That's how we avoid using praise the Lord, glory to God, hallelujah, as cliches. I'm saying this from my own wrong experiences. Use the name of God with sincerity, not as an expression or habit. What's the second way we misuse the name of God? It's through bad language. When we use the revered name of God as an ordinary word, for example, using God's name impulsively. Can I talk about what's not obviously bad first? When we sing, and then it's not in our hearts. Do you know I also make that mistake when I'm singing with you? My mind is sometimes on the sermon. Uh, Point number three Sub-point A, but I'm singing, and I have to remind myself, you, you better latch on and worship the Lord with God's people, uh, and I have to remind myself of that. Do we sing in sincerely? That's using God's name impulsively. Here's another way. Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, Jesus said, when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans. For they think they will be heard because of their many words. It's like this. What will you think of my son if he comes to me and talks to me like this about allowance? Oh, dad, my dad on earth. Thank you, my dad on earth, for giving me 20 pesos above my usual allowance. Dad, oh, dad, you wonderful dad. May you live longer, my dad, oh, my dad. You know what I will tell him? Son, are you into drugs? You better stop that, you know? Uh, That's the way we pray, right? Oh, holy and exalted one. Most That's okay if you mean every word. But, you know, maybe I can imagine God must be tapping his foot. Okay, get on with it. What do you want, you know? Uh, Stop flattering me. Because the way you talk to God is the way you talk to your father. Although we must not disrespect him, you must remember your father is king of the universe, but he's still your father, right? So you talk to him like a normal father, and and don't try to flatter him. But if you mean it, then say it, but don't use words you don't really mean. Don't use his name impulsively. Here's one more way, one more example, actually. It's the famous three words, OMG. Are you guilty of that? Uh, (laughs) I was watching this show on, I think it was History Channel. There was this guy who gave this two expert car restorers $10,000 to restore his very ancient antique car, but for which he had a lot of sentimental feeling. So there's two experts, maybe you watch it. They restored the car to perfect condition. So the first time this guy who gave the $10,000 saw the car, you know, he said, OMG, 10 times in two minutes, you know. Oh, my God, what did you do with the wheel? Oh, my God, the canopy is completely shed. Oh, my God, the windshield wiper. You know, I was thinking, oh, my God, 10 times in two minutes. I wish you meant that, but I know he didn't. It makes you cringe. You, you feel sorry for God. I'm not trying to be self-righteous here. It's just that there was obviously no meaning about God in it. He was just an expression. Are we guilty of that? Remember, God's name is inseparable from His reputation, His character, His authority. Why don't we say other words? Why do we use God? Why don't you say, oh, my Buddha? That's less harmful, you know what? He will not rise from wherever he is. I don't know where he is, by the way, and haunt you. But God, creator of the universe, God, demons tremble before the feet of Jesus Christ. 
and we just take His Word, His name to our lips and use it to say, I'm so happy about my car. OMG. I told you I said ouch many times here. I hope you're sharing the pain. Okay, beloved, remember this. As a Christian, the name of God, especially the name of Jesus, is the name that saved your soul. According to Jesus, the careless way of using God's name has consequences. Matthew 12, 36 to 37. But I tell you that men will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, by your words, you will be condemned. Let's remember this, and I hope that us or our teenage children will never say that word, OMG, ever, ever again. Here's the third way that we misuse the name of God, the one that needs special stress, because I also break this a lot, it's keeping promises. Leviticus 19.12 says, do not swear falsely by my name and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. What does it mean? When you are a Christian, it's simply a contraction of two, your, two words. Christ's one. A Christian is Christ's one. Whenever a Christian makes a promise, even without invoking the name of God, because I'm a Christ one, I'm actually involving God. Are you following me, beloved? So I'm asking you for your forgiveness because some of you, when I stand near the door, will say, Pastor, could you do this for me, this wedding, this funeral, this child dedication, bless my office. Sometimes you get irritated with me because I say, uh, could, could I just take down your number? Because I have a bad habit. I think it's common among pastors always saying yes. So for some of you, I've had to apologize because I will tell you, yes, I can do that. And then Monday, my wife will tell me, you said yes to this? You have a wedding on this day. How can you do two weddings on the same hour? And I have to call somebody and say, I'm sorry, I said yes to you. I hope you haven't put my name in the invitation. I told you this message gave me a lot of ouch. Is it the same for you? Do you give promises you cannot keep? Beloved, it reflects on the one by whom we are called. You are Christ one. We dare not make God an accomplice to anything that is false or unsuitable because it shows disrespect for the name by which we are called. In Matthew 5, 33 to 36, Jesus attacked the Pharisees' idea that you can break without guilt any promise as long as you did not use God's name. You see, that was the Pharisees. They said, we belong to God. So Jesus told them, okay, you belong to God. That's your claim. Okay. Then I want you to correct this wrong impression you're saying, I'm not blaspheming God because I make promises without using His name. And Jesus said, if you swear by heaven or by earth or by Jerusalem or by your own heads, that's in Matthew 5, 33 to 36, He's saying all of that is God's. So if you make any promise and if you claim to belong to God, you're actually involving God and you're guilty of making Him an accomplice in your unfaithfulness. So the godly person must make promises cautiously, but keep them conscientiously once they are made. Are you following me, beloved? That's another way we misuse God's name, promises we do not keep. Pastor, how can I use God's name correctly? Years ago, I saw a bare bones outline by an unnamed author with three points, and I expanded on that outline as follows. The first way we use God's name correctly is to revere God's name continually. Psalm 29, to ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Because of Jesus Christ, you can call God, I can call God Father. Isn't that amazing? The God who is the only true God because of Jesus. I can call Him Abba. 
Abba is an Aramaic term, which is actually dad. Is that disrespectful, Pastor? Not exactly. As long as you call him whatever you want to call him, father, if you want to call him father. But never forgetting this father is king. This father, angels bow before him. They cover their faces out of humility because of the splendor of his glory. As long as you keep that in mind, go ahead and call him Father. Father. And how do you know that's how Jesus wants us to revere God? When he was teaching his disciples to pray, he said, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. There's intimacy, Father. There's reverence. Hallowed be your name. He's saying you call him Father, but don't you dare forget. His name is lifted up. Reverence for God and His name is still prevalent in our time, the New Testament age. However, the stress is now shifted to the name of Jesus, God in the flesh. We are now to believe in the name of Jesus, John 1, 12. We are now baptized in the name of Jesus, Acts 8, 16. We now worship in the name of Jesus, Acts 9, 14. And there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved, Acts 4, 12. I recall a young lady who was running home to her mother after Sunday school. And the mom asked this girl, oh, so what did you learn in Sunday school? Oh, we heard about the Christmas story, mommy, about the angel who told Mary, the girl who was about to give birth, that this is the name of that child. So what did you learn? Mommy, I learned about his name, but can I ask you something, mommy? Why did the angel give that poor little baby a bad word for a name? You see, that girl had heard the name of Jesus used only for cursing. And so when she heard that the angel wanted Jesus' name, Jesus, she said, why did the angel give that poor little baby a bad name, a bad word? Beloved, reverence for the name of God includes reverence for the name of Christ. Psalm 61.5 says, for you had given me the blessings of those who fear your name. How can I use God's name correctly? Revere God's name continually. Second, represent God's name clearly. Second Timothy 2.19 says, everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. What does it mean? If I say that the Lord is my Lord, if I say Jesus is my Lord, I better turn away from wickedness. Otherwise, I'm defiling His name. And you know what? At the minimum, it involves not being ashamed of Jesus. Are we ashamed of Jesus? Are we ashamed of being identified with Him? I hope not. You know, it comes to my mind that we have a general who sits at Krame, a general Cesar Binag. He's not only not ashamed of Christ, he holds Bible study for his fellow police officers. Talk about somebody who represents the name of Christ clearly. I love that moment when last Monday, when the Meralco Bolts, against all predictions, won in their fight against the talk and text. And Coach Norman Black was interviewed on TV and heard publicly to say, I thank the Lord. That's somebody who represents God's name clearly. How about us? Are we ashamed to be associated with Christ? I hope not. I hope we're willing to represent Jesus' name clearly because the Bible teaches us we reflect the name of God to this world like ambassadors. And that failure to represent Him faithfully in the way we live or speak is equivalent to misusing His name. If I hide that Jesus is my Savior, if nobody knows, if I hide Him, I am misusing His name. Represent God's name clearly. And thirdly, 
rely on God's name completely. What does that mean, Pastor? First of all, Jesus said in John 16, 23, whatever you ask of God, ask in my name. Did you notice that's the way we pray? Have you ever asked, why do we pray in Jesus' name? It goes like this. What if I pray? Lord, will you help us set up another church plan? Help us keep spreading the gospel where there are no churches yet. We want to plant this church where there are no other churches nearby. Lord, I ask in Larry's name, amen. What will God say? Maybe he will say in his heart, son, I love you. But something doesn't sound right. So what is the right way to pray? Lord, I ask in the name of your own son, Jesus Christ. He is worthy, I am not. I ask in his name because he is powerful, I am not. I ask in his name because there is no other name under heaven by which I was saved. I ask in his name because there is one God and one mediator. And I'm asking in the name of my mediator, the only one. And God will say, now you've got it. That's what Jesus meant by John 16, 23 to 24. We pray in the name of Jesus because we have no right to come to God on our own worthiness. And here's the second thing about relying on God's name completely. When we trust His name, when we surrender to Him in a life of love and trust, God is honored. Here's a question I've been asked. Pastor, is it right to pray for your favorite team in a certain sport to win? You know, uh, like you Hinebra people. Sorry to say you were beaten by Meralco last Friday. I hope you are healing. Okay? Uh, is it wrong to pray? Well, this is how you pray. Lord, I pray they do their best. I pray that the calls will be right by the referees. I pray that no mistakes will be done by this team. It's hard to pray for them to win. You say, Lord, if it's good for them, let them win. That's how you pray. Because God will grant your prayers according to His will. But what He wants is that you trust His name. When you surrender to Him in a life of love and trust, God is honored. So what if your team loses? You'll say, Lord, it's okay. It's not the end of my world. And besides, Lord, maybe they'll learn to be better next season, something like that. So you Golden State Warriors fans who are still weeping, be comforted. How do I live on the shame of Christ? Revere God's name continually. Represent God's name clearly. Rely on God's name completely. But God completes the picture by the consequence. What's the consequence? He said, the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses His name. What does it mean, Pastor? It means to trivialize God's name is to diminish His person and His glory. When I say, OMG, I could justify it, say, I didn't mean to disrespect God. Of course, you didn't mean to. But if anybody heard you, they will also disrespect God like you just did. To trivialize God's name is to show the utmost disrespect for the God to whom we owe all things. Now, I know there are lawyers here. There are judges who worship with us. Have you ever heard anybody being sent to jail in the Philippines for saying, OMG? Of course not. But what if you commit murder? You might. What if you uh, give false witness? Oh, you might be cited for perjury. What if you commit adultery? Well... If the courts don't get you, society will. You getting my drift? What if you steal? The courts and society will probably get you. But do you go to jail for saying, OMG, 10 times in 2 minutes because you got a brand new car? You don't. So do we take that for granted? No. God says, no human court will run after you. Society might even laugh at you and think you're cute or updated or cool. But if you persistently, habitually take my name in your lips and you make it like nothing, God says, it's not the human court you must fear. It's me. 
And I don't know about you, I'm, I'm more scared of that than of human courts or of human prison. God says, I will be the one to run after you. God will directly sanction those who persistently, in an unrepentant way, violate the third commandment. I want to read for you Jeremiah 5, to 25. If you're taking notes, I, I hope you read this again on your own. It, it's so instructive. Jeremiah 5, to 25. God here was addressing to the prophet Jeremiah the kingdom of Judah. You know, remember Israel was divided, northern kingdom, southern kingdom. Judah was the more righteous kingdom. But Jeremiah was sent to them to tell them, you repent of your idolatry, of taking God for granted. Otherwise, the invader called Babylon will wipe you out. They didn't listen. You know the, the story, right? So here in Jeremiah 5.22, here's the warning still ongoing. Should you not fear me, declares the Lord, should you not tremble in my presence? But these people have stubborn and rebellious hearts. They do not say to themselves, let us fear the Lord our God, who gives rain in season who assures us of harvest. And he says to Jeremiah, your wrongdoings have kept these away from you. What these? Rain in season, harvest. Your sins have deprived you of good. These are God's covenant people. It's a warning to Christians today. God judges us sometimes by withholding blessings from us. That's what it means. The Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses His name. Don't let this happen to you, beloved. Don't let it be said of you. This is a principle, by the way, found throughout the Bible, not just in Jeremiah 5. If I persistently, in an unrepentant way, take God's name and not fear Him, God says, Christian, you're depriving yourself of the blessings of God. So in closing, beloved, I want to go back to our bottom line that we began with. Those who honor God's name actually honor God Himself. They will be blessed. But those who dishonor His name and persistently do so will be judged. Pastor, it's the New Testament. We are living in the age of grace. How do I apply these words to my life? Beloved, like I told you earlier, it's the name of Jesus that now God wants us to continually revere. I, I want to share with you my personal translation of Philippians 2, 5 to 11. Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider being equal with God something to take advantage of, but He laid aside His privileges took the form of a servant in human likeness, and while appearing as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee must bow, in heaven, on earth, under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know what this is saying? We all will bow before Jesus. If you bow your knee today to Jesus as Savior and Lord, you will not have to bow reluctantly to Him one day just before God sent you away to eternal condemnation. The question is not will you, it's when. Will you bow now? To Jesus, tell Him, I am a great sinner, but Lord Jesus, You are a great Savior who died on the cross for me, and I plead for forgiveness. I plead for mercy. Save me, Jesus. If you do that, you're bowing in your heart to the Lord Jesus. If you persistently refuse and say, well, I'm good enough, isn't God reasonable like most people are? I go to church. I do good work. I'm not blatantly sinful. Why don't we, they start with the maximum security inmates? I'm good enough. And you will not bow. One day 
you will. You'll be forced to bow before Jesus Christ. That's Philippians 2, 5 to 11. But there will be no second chance. You'll be forced to bow before you're sent away for eternal destruction. Will you bow now before the Lord Jesus Christ? Will you bow before Him later for eternal condemnation? That is the glory of the name of Jesus Christ. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. You know, the early Christians, they never had any doubt about the glory of that name. They got what Paul was saying. For them, the glory of that name was such that it was their assurance. It often meant death for them. For the businessmen in those days, it meant not getting those deals. For the housewives of that day, it meant getting blank stares or, or, or bad stares at the, at the market. For the Christians in those days, sometimes it meant going to prison. For the Christians in those days, sometimes it meant being sent to their death, but they never lost the glory of that name. They would die for it. For them, it was a conquest of earth by heaven. You know what happened in 2016? The glory of that name has been lost to us. The name that Paul said, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. We seem to have lost that glory. We no longer have the grand yes of God's name. We no longer have the grand yes of the third commandment, the commandment that tells us to live in the power of God's name. Please, don't make the mistake. Cursing is one way to misuse God's name. But among us, between us as family, the more common way we misuse God's name, we no longer live. In its wonder, its power. We say OMG carelessly. We say Jesus Christ, not as a call upon Him to save us, as an expression of exasperation. We've lost the wonder and power. Beloved, let's make sure that whether by words or actions, we honor the name of our God. Let's not live like people ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to leave you with this quote from a hymn by Lydia Baxter. She said, Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then where'er you go. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. My brothers and sisters, let's not live ashamed of His name. Let's instead take His name with us wherever we go. Let's stand together for the benediction, and let's pray. Father, the prayer of my heart is that You've reminded us right now to simply revere your name. Forgive us who preach, sometimes carelessly take it into our lips. Forgive us who carelessly sometimes use your holy name as an expression of surprise or delight, but not really ascribe glory or goodness to you. Forgive us for the times that we used your name to justify our wrongdoing or use it to intimidate others, Lord. Forgive us for those times. Forgive us for those times, Lord, when we were not willing to be identified for one reason or another with the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for some of us, Lord, who've shown us the way, willing to speak in public about what they believe in, Enable us to live like that. Beloved of God, may you take the name of Jesus with you. May you take his name with you everywhere you go. May his name never be just an expression on your lips, 
May it be the name of the God who saved you. May you be willing to share the wonder and glory of that name to those who are dying apart from Christ. May you discover that that's the most wonderful kind of life there is, to be unashamed of Christ, to speak of Him with passion in your heart, the name of the one who saved you. This is my prayer for you through Jesus Christ, in the name of the one who died for us. Amen and amen. God bless you all. You go with God.